Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing weekend. We're going to be kicking this video off with several pieces of AMD news, the first of which concerns Zen 4 slash Genoa. So this, of course, will be the successor to the Zen 3 architecture. Zen 3 will launch in 2020, whereas Zen 4 will launch in 2021 and we've had a couple of details of this upcoming CPU leaked thanks to Momomo on Twitter. According to him we will see the usage of DDR4 memory it's apparently confirmed which isn't surprising after all one of the reasons that AMD are changing the platform one of the reasons they're changing the socket for example from AM4 to whatever uh, the Ryzen 5000 series will use, assuming it is called Ryzen 5000, is so that they can shift too fast to memory. At the end of the day, more CPU cores, faster clock frequencies on the memory, uh, sorry, faster clock frequencies on the CPU, and so on and so on, it's great, but if you can't feed it by actually providing it enough memory bandwidth, it doesn't really matter. So that's one thing. And the second is that it will be utilizing the PCIe 5.0 interface. This is another thing that was kind of anticipated, but it's nice to see that it's confirmed here. It's kind of the same story as memory, actually. If you don't communicate with the uh, peripherals inside the system or in discrete GPUs or let's say SSDs or whatever in a fast enough manner, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how quick the CPU is. So now that we're shifting to new eras of GPU computing and uh, ASICs and whatever else for, of course, what's coming up in the future, then obviously fast communication is going to be extremely imperative. We do have some more Intel news later on, but since we're discussing this same tweet, we might as well just throw this in here, that in 2021 we will also see Intel launch Sapphire Rapids slash EagleStream, which will be on the LGA4677 platform, which will also support DDR5 along with PCIe5 as well. Another thing that was rather interesting is the wording. He actually called this Fred Monster, and there are definitely a lot of rumours that we will be seeing an increased core count for Zen 4 based products. From my understanding, and I've heard this from several sources, we will not see an increase in the number of CPU cores for Zen 3 products. So let's say for the sake of argument, uh, Milan, which of course will be the successor to the uh, server processors Rome from AMD, that won't uh, increase from 64 processor cores. The Ryzen 4000 series CPUs won't increase from 16 CPU cores that we have for the 3950X and so on. It will remain consistent. This was hinted at by an AMD roadmap, and I've personally heard it from a couple of different sources now, that AMD will remain at the same core count, but obviously there will be tweaks to the architecture. I've uh, released a video a while ago that I've heard at least 8% IPC gains for the Zen 3 process architecture and the derivatives of that, so Ryzen 4000. And I've also been told that it's shaping up to be a really impressive architecture based upon the engineering samples, and I don't just mean in terms of the uh, clock frequency bump as well as the IPC gains, it's apparently going to be really impressive, although apparently it does not support AVX 512. That isn't necessarily a really big deal, but it is nice to hear that it's not just going to be a small iterative bump. There were some concerns, if you can call it concerns, that it was going to be more of a Zen Plus rather than, you know, a large step forward. So we would see minor improvements in IPC, we would see a reduction in power consumption and temperatures and blah blah blah, but that doesn't look like it's going to be the case. Uh, Zen 3 is going to be sending off the current platforms in a very good manner. So it's going to be really interesting to see exactly what we see from AMD with that generation of CPUs. Uh, I've heard from a couple of people, although they're not my primary sources, that Big Narve is going to launch next year. So that would be Narve 12, and it will not launch this year. There was a there was a delay of sorts. You might recall from one of my recent uh, Radeon slash RDNA analysis videos, I'll try to remember to link it in the video description, where I went through what we know about Narve 12, 14, Narve 23, and so on and so on, plus AMD's ray tracing plans that a couple of my sources had told me that Narve 20 had been delayed as well. So, 
Uh, we might actually see that in the latter part of next year, but Narve 23 is going to be a really impressive GPU from what I'm told. I've been told it's going to be a quote NVIDIA killer, although of course we don't know what the heck's going on with Ampere, NVIDIA's architecture, so I'll remain a little sceptical until we actually get performance numbers, despite the fact that the engineers of AMD are saying that it's going to be a really impressive GPU, but you know, we'll wait and see on that. Uh, so it looks like Narve 12 is going to be delayed until some point next year. Hopefully it's not too long. It's kind of frustrating that the only high-end GPU we currently have right now is the RTX 2080 Ti. And it's like, I'm not saying the RTX 2080 Ti is a bad GPU, I'm not. But it's also rather expensive. And the fact of the matter is that it does crush most games at 4K. But even without ray tracing enabled, some games are just... I wouldn't exactly say that they're flying by. And yeah, if you look at something like Shadow of the Tomb Raider with 4K, all of the settings at max with ray tracing disabled, you you know, it's not getting 120 FPS, is it? So there is a kind of part of me that does feel a little bit better of uh, suggesting that people who do want to play at highest quality settings do cough up like a, a 1200 bucks on a graphics card, but it is the fastest single GPU available right now. There are those murmurs that we will see an RTX 2080 Ti Super or Super Ti or whatever the hell NVIDIA call it, but I personally don't think they're going to launch the card. I think that they may have considered it, but I don't necessarily know if they will end up launching it. Um, we can only wait, though, to see what the heck's going on with GeForce 30. So hopefully AMD do put a lot of pressure on NVIDIA's higher-end cards with Narve 12. Uh, but yeah. And now we're going to move over to a leaked review, courtesy of Lab501.ro, of the 10980XC HEDT processor from Intel's upcoming Cascade Lake X lineup. This is an 18-core 36 thread processor and I'll link the full leaked review in the description of the video. We will go through a few results here but to be honest with you Cascade Logue X and the 10980XC is basically what we expected given the leaks so far. So as a quick reminder the architecture is still based on Skylake albeit with a few changes. The biggest difference between Skylake X and Cascade Logue X is the pricing. Intel have essentially halved the cost for Cascade Lake X, which is obviously going to be massive for a determining factor as if you want to purchase the CPU. We kind of knew that Intel would not be able to beat AMD in terms of raw performance with Cascade Lake X versus the third generation Threadripper CPU, so Intel are going with more value oriented proposition, and the higher clock frequency, in theory, we don't know what Threadripper runs at yet, uh, and also some other enhancements we've seen. So one of those is deep learning instruction set, which is obviously going to uh, definitely impact certain users. We also see some enhancements in multi-core turbo, uh, which is going to definitely impact gamers, some higher clock frequencies. But as I said, the biggest difference is definitely going to be coming down to the pricing. So according to Lab 501 uh, in Far Cry New Dawn, we'll start with a couple of games first, although I would, of course, not advise you to purchase any HEDT CPU with the primary role of gaming. At 1080p, and we're only going to look at 1080p results, we have 90 FPS on average for the XC versus the 9900K, which scores 121 points. These are all on a GTX 2080 Ti, these results. And yes, I did say GTX 2080 Ti. Uh, obviously, someone screwed up when they were making those graphs, which is kind of easy to do. Anyway, this means that the 98, sorry, the 980XE wins against the, uh, well, none of the processors. So this is one of those cases where, of course, uh, being a HEDT processor, it loses to just about any gaming focused CPU. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a bit of a different story. Um, this set of results is much closer at 1080p. Uh, this game is extremely punishing on the GPU even at just 1080p and so all of the cards here essentially, sorry, all of the CPUs here essentially score identical at around 175-ish FPS and around 130 
538 excuse me, FPS when it comes to the minimum. Cinebench R20, easily one of the most uh, well-known benchmarks out there. And the 980XE scores 8,563 points, which is around 1,500 points higher than the 3900X. I'm sure you're probably wondering then how well the 3950X scores, and yes, you're not the only one. This is one of those tests where, uh, simply put, the 980XE does have an advantage, uh, but... In terms of performance per dollar, obviously the 3900X, despite it losing technically, is the winner in terms of uh, value. And the same thing could also be said for POV Ray 3.0. 7300 points for the 980XE, putting it around mm, 1100-ish points, 1150-ish points above the 3900X. Chess Test BMI 2. This is definitely a major win for the 980XE. It scores roughly double that of the 3900X in this particular benchmark. And the final tests that I'm going to go through are A to 64. Uh, in terms of memory bandwidth, of course, simply because the fact that it has more memory channels and bloody bloody blah blah. blah the 980XE does win out in just about every test. It's a pity that there isn't a Skylake X CPU for comparison with these results. So I'm going to give you the quick conclusion here because it is, well, pretty much what we expected. Intel are not going to win RAR, haha, in terms of sheer performance against Threadripper most likely, in most benchmarks. There are probably going to be some scenarios where you may want to go uh, Cascade Lake X no matter what your budget. Maybe if you're doing some deep learning stuff, gaming is also a major a major primary factor for you, blah blah blah, then probably Cascade Lake X may be a better choice over Threadripper. The other potential is that you have a limited budget, but you also need lots of memory bandwidth and yada yada yada. And obviously Intel will need to convince us of that because we don't know what the prices of the third generation Threadripper are and we also don't know what the performance is. But let's just be real here. There's absolutely no way that 18 cores of the Cascade Lake X can hold a candle to 32 cores or more potentially for a third generation Threadripper CPU. And that's fine depending on how Intel choose to market it. And what the prices are as well we see from AMD. Hopefully, the prices from AMD won't be too brutal. The biggest fawn in the side of Cascade Lake X is the 3950. Probably not even Threadripper. Because obviously, um, from what I'm hearing anyway, the 3950X is absolutely monstrous in terms of performance. And clearly speaking, you would also have a cheaper platform cost as well. Anyway... With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then of course subscribe to the channel because it helps us out a lot and also drop a like on the video because, well, that also helps us out a lot. You can also find us linked on social media down, down there, down below. And you can follow us, of course, on Twitter for shenanigans. And if you so desire, you can also support us on Patreon. Uh, anything you do give on Patreon does help us with uh, buying review samples and the running of the channel. So, of course, any pennies you give are greatly appreciated. And we have used that to buy, let's say, the 3700X, for example. So that's what you see back there. So thanks very much for helping contribute to the channel, watching it, and uh, for all of the email, social media interaction, and so on. Thanks very much, guys. With all of that said... I'm going to let you all go. Have an amazing weekend or what's left of it. Bye for now.